Oh, good. Okay, we're getting it recorded. Good. So, um, so uh, it, it really um, the the board score sheet is um, sort of community property, and uh, and in this O'Keefe CG um, book and and O'KeefeCG.com, which I think is is actually a better way to to use as a study guide, but. I've curated uh, about 220 ECGs that are representative of the kind of things you see on boards. I always quiz the the, the fellows uh, every year after they take the boards to find out uh, what what um, what ECGs were on the on the board um, uh, this year. So I have a pretty good idea at, uh, what's on there. And also, like I say, we uh, did this way back when I was at Drew Stage when I was a fellow up at Mayo Clinic back in the 80s, and I. Um, uh, thought that, well, you know, this should be the easiest part of the boards because we can just, you know, uh, define, get a consensus definition for each of the 89 diagnoses and then show a bunch of ECGs that have those, um, have those diagnoses on them. So, and if you use this study guide that, that okeefeecg.com, um, I guarantee you, you will, you will ace the, um, the ECG part of the boards. So, um, Yev, are we ready to get going? Oh, he's sharing some content. Okay. Good. So I have uh, uh, curated, um, you know, um, I don't know, up to 20 ECGs, uh, depending on how, how quickly we can go through them. And it's a lot more fun if you guys just, you know, when I show one, you just want to chime in and, and, and uh, tell me what it is. You don't need to worry too much about the details. Uh, I can go through the details on how to score each one um, after we kind of Get a feel for it, but it's. I think it's more fun to uh, uh, if it's if it's an interactive um, session. And uh, Dr. Okey, yep, yep. If you if you just give me one second before you begin, I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping uh, yep. issues for everybody. Um, okay. So as Dr. Okey was saying, thank you so much for attending. If you could just all remember to silence your microphones. You are all muted on entry, but if you do volunteer, please just remember to silence your microphone afterwards to avoid extra chatter. You can also pose additional questions in the chat box to avoid um, any additional chatter after uh, an EKG is presented, and we will try and uh, get to those questions as well. And as Dr. O'Keefe was saying, please uh, feel free to participate. The one other uh, item that I was going to share with you um, was the uh, actual score sheet. If uh, you are on a platform that allows you to do a screenshot of the score sheet, then you can use this to uh, score the EKGs as we go through this presentation. So if you can all take a moment and uh, take a snapshot of this, then this would, uh, I think, be very helpful as you go through and code these EKGs with uh, Dr. O'Keefe. Uh, with that, sir, um, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, uh, then I think we're ready to get started. Okay. You see that okay? Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So um, this is what the uh, the OKP CG website looks like. Uh, we'll just go into um, this uh, list of the different cases, and we'll pull up. We'll start off with a pretty straightforward one. These, um, like I said, these are the kind of things you can expect to see on your board. So this is a fifty-seven-year-old female cigarette smoker. Who presents in the ED with a chest tightness after a syncopal spell, and uh, being the cardiology fellow on uh, uh, on call, you show up in the ED, and this is the ECG. So, uh, so what do we think of this? Anybody want to volunteer, or uh, yeah, you want to kick us off? Yeah, um, so sorry, sorry um, about that. Do you hear me okay? Yeah, somebody else. Uh, oh, tried. go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah, I can just try. It looks like white complex, uh, almost regular tachycardia, but I also see like there is AV dissociation and also I see some 
uh, fusion complexes and uh, perfect yeah so i think this is vtac right yeah, very good so this is vtac it's not as wide as lots of vtac you'll see but the pathognomonic thing here is these fusion complexes that you pointed out and this over here is a capture complex um, and this one's a capture complex as well and you can see this one in particular um, is uh, got some ST segment elevation and, and a Q wave there. So in fact, this this 57 year old female was having an infarct, and when we um, uh, when we cardioverted her, there was a there was an injury pattern over here in the uh, uh, inferior leads. She had an acutely occluded RCA that that we opened. But um, yeah, when you see capture comp, so this is narrow com this is wide complex. It's about 135 milliseconds uh, with these capture and fusion complexes. Um, and then there's another thing that, 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 that you'd want to code on here, these, these varying sizes of the QRSs is called electrical alternands. So you'd go, uh, you'd go uh, just ventricular tachycardia here, you'd score that, um, and then electrical alternands, and then the, um, you know, you could call it code a sinus rhythm because I think that's a P wave over there. Um, it looks like a P wave up there, but but that's kind of optional. They wouldn't mark you off for that. So mostly it's just ventricular tachycardia, and and uh, as you pointed out, it's AV dissociation. Which whenever you see P waves or capture complexes with ventricular tachycardia, you would know that that's um, that's what we're dealing with. So that's uh, that's the ventricular tachycardia, and we we got that right. Um, so the um, let's. Um, Go back. The um, you will probably see a ventricular tachycardia case on there. It's very important to pay close attention to the stem, the little lead-in, because these are cases they've you know picked for a reason, and uh, and lots of times if they're a little tricky, and even if they aren't tricky, uh, pay close attention to that uh, to that stem up there because it really will lead you down the path of uh, of where you're likely to need to go. So we'll um, look at this as a 66-year-old male smoker who had a told knee replacement just earlier in the day, about eight hours ago. You, uh, you need uh, consult it on this one. You do the 12 lead ECG, and this is what it looks like. This is another tracing, uh, like the BT, that, uh, that tends to show up on the boards. It tends to show up in clinical practice pretty often, too, it's, uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's something that can be a... Um, sort of uh, easy to confuse for other things. Anybody want to take a look at this? This this uh, 66 year old male smoker who's uh, early post-op, got some tachycardia going on. Give you a clue, it's helpful down here in the, in the rhythm strip bleed. Is it Matt, Dr. Otis? Very good. It's Matt. Yeah, multifocal atrial tachycardia. Again, this is often seen in you know people with lung disease, people uh, critically ill uh, on on uh, sympathomimetic inhalers and things like that. The early post-op, it's a very common tracing, often uh, um, mistaken for uh, AFib because it's irregularly irregular. But but you'll see, uh, uh, so it's above 100 beats per minute. And there's more than, and, and a, a quick clue, like normally we just look at the formal reading on the ECG to check the rate and the QT and the PR interval, but uh, for the boards, you won't have that luxury. So a quick way to do it is just count across the bottom here and it's 12 leads are always 10 seconds. So you just count that and uh, multiply, um, uh, multiply by six and you'll have the answer. And this is about 17, I mean, 17 or 18 beats. So it's, so it's over hundred. Um, six, six times 16, of course, is 96. So if it's, if it's more than 16 beats across there, it's, it's a tachycardia. And there's more than three P wave morphologies. Here's one, sort of the dominant one. Here's one, two, three, four. There's a lot of different P waves here. This is multifocal atrial tachycardia. And, oh, the, the nice thing that, you know, we spent a lot of time on this, um, uh, on, on this particular um, feature, but like if you want to say, gee, you know, I I, um, I need to know more about multifocal atrial tachycardia, and it's really good for you to use a site like this, and as Yev said, to, to really familiarize yourself with these 89 diagnoses, but 
the, the thing I love about uh, our website is you can press this little I um, button at the end of each diagnosis and it'll tell you a consensus uh, diagnosis of uh, a definition and also another example or two of multifocal atrial tachycardia. So the rate has to be above 100. You get these. Oh, when you have multifocal atrial tachycardia, you don't call uh, uh, right, uh, right atrial enlargement if you see it in one or two beats because it generally, um, unless it's there all the time. So uh, let's go to um, the other one that shows up frequently on the boards. Here's a 17 year old male with a history of seizures in quotations marks, uh, but no cardiac history, no prior cardiac history. And um, he's, um, he's uh, being seen as an outpatient. So uh, what do we think of this tracing? 17 year old. Looks like we have Parkinson White. Say again? Looks like we have Parkinson White. Perfect. Some yeah, that's way. right. WPW. So would you call the LVH or QRS I White? I wouldn't do the killers. No. Yeah. So the thing that is, so, so the, 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 the key with WPW is, and you may well see one on the tracing, you look for the slurred upstroke, the classic delta wave, the short PR interval. You lots of times have funny looking uh, intraventricular conduction defect because this, this uh, complex represents a melding, a fusion of the sinus uh, beat going down through the AV node and scooting through the bypass tract. And so they come together and cause all sorts of strange um, patterns which you just ignore, okay? Uh, even the atrial abnormality, you generally, on this one, you'd code just a sinus rhythm up there, and then you'd code the uh, WPW, Wolf Parkinson White, and, uh, and, then, and then call it a day, move on to the next ECG, because, uh, because it distorts the axis, the, ventric the ventricle, everything else. And, um, um, oh, this one actually... This is this is kind of tricky, and you wouldn't get marked off much for this, but you know, always look at the rhythm strip at the bottom. So this is a sinus rhythm, of course, but this is a 17-year-old, and when he breathes out, his heart rate slows down. When he breathes in, it speeds up, and so this phasic change, most noticeable over here, that's sinus arrhythmia. Uh, and when it's a sinus rhythm, you don't have to code sinus rhythm with sinus arrhythmia, but if it's sinus tachycardia with sinus arrhythmia, which is pretty unusual, or more likely sinus bradycardia with sinus arrhythmia, you probably should code both of those. <clears throat> so, you know, take a look at the rhythm strip for, for, um, for things like that. Why, why wouldn't we call it an LVH? Oh, because, um, because even though it looks like LVH, it's not. It's, it, it gets distorted by um, the voltage and the axis and the QRS width gets distorted by, you know, this is, mostly like uh, uh, reflective of ventricular um, a beat uh, originating in the ventricle, which then, you know, you, like on a ventricular tachycardia or a PVC, you don't call, you don't call um, LVH on it because it's, it's not a true representation of the actual voltage. And this is a good example. This kid had, had an ablation of his AV tract and his cure and his, his ECG was perfectly normal afterwards. So. Thank you. Good question. Dr. O'Keefe, there was a question about the prior ECG. I believe it was the multifocal atrial tachycardia ECG. What would be a consideration for the coding criteria if this was not technically a tachycardia? Um, so, yeah, if it, 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 so if it was a rate of 90, then it would just be uh, frequent PACs, you know, so, so you'd have the, you know, you would have the APCs or PACs, whichever you want to call them. But on the score sheet, you know, you would... Uh, you would just code for the um, the atrial premature contractions here, atrial premature complex. Good question. How you guys are discerning? All right, so we'll switch gears a little bit and uh, get this as. Um, So here we have, again, pay attention to this stem, 45-year-old male being seen prior to surgery, preoperative for a resection of a parathyroid adenoma. Maybe you want to 
venture, I guess. I mean, you almost wouldn't even need to look at the ECG, just look at the stem. And, and QT? yeah, it's a short QT. And there are like four, four or five, I'll show you in a moment, um, options well down here for, uh, for electrolyte abnormalities, but this is one. I mean, parathyroid adenoma, you know, hyperparathyroidism, this is, this is a short QT interval. It's only 320 milliseconds for a pretty slow rate. I mean, it's like a 40, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So 42 beats per minute. Um, and by the way, this is what I was just telling you about. This is sinus bradycardia and sinus arrhythmia, somebody with a high bagel tone, relatively young person, short QT interval, way shorter than it should be. Um, and yeah, that, that, that AV, that, that, um, there's a first degree AV block as well. So, like when you score, when you score this, this is why, why it's so important to be really familiar with uh, with this score sheet. And the best way to do it is by doing a bunch of these kind of uh, ECGs, where you have to search this out and say, "Oh, there's a STT changes suggesting electrolyte disturbance." That's a perfect spot to use that. This is sinus bradycardia over here, and sinus arrhythmia. We'd score both of those because they're kind of independent things that don't necessarily um, uh, go hand in hand. I mean, they often do, but not necessarily. And then you'd score over here, hypercalcemia. The high calcium goes along with the, um, with the hyperparathyroidism. And uh, that should be about it, I think. We, you know, we don't need to, but, you know, normally you'd spend like, I think they give you three minutes in ECG. So you can kind of go through and make sure that you get, um, so what did we miss here? Oh, the, I didn't score the first gravy block. It was there, but yeah. So, um, yeah. Oh, oh, so so a good point to make here is like there's sort of this a little bit of a cute. Uh, there's a little notching. If you look closely, you can blow this up. It's easy enough to do. There's a little notching right there in the uh, at the at the J point, and um, so you probably think of you know uh, of this kind of you know, early repolarization abnormalities in a normal variant, and it is very common in young, healthy people and athletes, um, blacks uh, a little bit more than, than whites, but very common. Um, but it's also seen in, in um, hyperthermia or hypercalcemia. Those are the three main places where you'll see this sort of benign, this, this sort of notching with this little Osborne wave out there. But this one is, is hypercal, hypercalcemia. Uh, so, uh, any questions on that one? Don't forget to code the STT changes suggesting of electrolyte disturbance. So here's a here's a, a 19 year old female who's asymptomatic comes in for her uh, check because she's uh, she's found out she's pregnant, and uh, they do this uh, ECG, and uh, this is what it shows. So. This one's not real common to show up on the boards, but it has at least once in the past. Anybody want to venture a guess at this one? What's with those? What's with those T waves? What you call those non-specific or? Again, the clue in the in the stem, you know, it's a young, healthy female in this case, pregnant. Nobody's going to guess. So if you go look at the at the options in the repolarization abnormalities, uh, there's one called juvenile T waves, which looks like this typically. You know, it's a young female. You see these inverted T waves in V1 to V3. Sometimes this would be one V2, but you the the T waves are still upright over in one in AVL and V5 V6, where the, lots of times they flip over in ischemia or LVH, those are the first spots to flip over in the in the uh, one AVL and V5, V6, which clues you into some pathology. But in this case, this is just a normal variant ECG, which is an option up there. And that's a sinus rhythm. And those are juvenile T waves. And we won't spend much more time on that. But, but this patient, this EKG, Dr. OPP, isn't there a T wave also in, I think, inferior leads? Yeah, you know, that's true. There, there, there is a little bit of inferior T waves down there inferiorly. 
which uh, sometimes we see in uh, juvenile TWIS, but you know, the classic one is more like the one I showed you the example uh, in the um, definition. So, you know, that, that's a good point. And it might relate to the fact that she's pregnant, which of course, you know. Um, and also, they, also if you see V4, V5 is also there. And then, so like that made us confused, right? Because yeah. it's not just in V1, V2, V3. It's also in V4, V5, and also in inferior lead. So. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And, and you know what? Um, yeah, I might change that out. That's a good point. I might change this example out for one that's more like, uh, like what we showed you before, where it's you know it's just stone cold normal, except for the um, except for the T wave abnormalities in V one to V three. It has to be two of the three in V one to V three. Um, and you know you could just uh, that's a really valid point. And you could just code this as non specific ST T wave abnormalities, which is uh, of course a you know a wide variety of different things that can cause that. But certainly you see them in in uh, in young healthy people and pregnant people and heart disease and all sorts of different things. It's, it's, it's a very common one. You know, I don't think they're going to on a board, uh, uh, for a board exam, you know, it's, it's so non specific and, and not and unimportant generally that they probably wouldn't give you a non specific STT abnormality. I mean, if it's there for some, you know, in some other tracing, then you'd code it for sure. But, um, <clears throat> all right. So here's another, uh, important one. Uh, is Dr. Your... Go ahead. Just real quickly, there was a question about whether or not there was any indication of lead reversal in that EKG based on the uh, precordial uh, voltages of, I believe it was V3 compared to V1, if I, if I remember correctly. I wasn't sure if there was, um, the, the question was about lead reversal and whether you would code that there. Oops. Well, we got kind of... Um, usually those are pretty straightforward. I mean, pretty, pretty clear cut. Um, especially on a board, uh, score sheet. Let's see. Well, they're all a little funny looking, aren't they? All right. You guys are very good. Um, I'll, I'll change that one out. So it's a little less, uh, Confusing. Okay, so um, so let's go to this one. This is a this is a, a fifty two year old comatose male in the ICU. You're being consulted on for an abnormal ECG after uh, he had a severe headache, collapsed, and now he's in the ICU. Very realistic ECG that might show up on your board score sheet on your board uh, test. Any, any suggestions? Uh, yeah, CNS system. System. Right, exactly. Yeah, so this is, when you see these deep T wave inversions across the precordial leads like that with, uh, I think that QT is probably long, that usually goes along with it, but um, they, um, th this, this, especially in a comatose male who's just had intracranial bleed, um, this is, there's a, there's a, on the clinical disorders, there's one called, um, uh, hyper, uh, sorry, uh, CNS, CNS uh, disorder. And, um, and so, you know, there, here's another example with a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You see these big T wave inversion and often QT prolongation, uh, prominent U waves. Uh, sometimes you have just big, giant, uh, large upright T waves as well. Um, and, um, it's due to, you know, just, uh, extreme disruption of the uh, autonomic nervous system. So, yeah, you code the sinus rhythm and the CNS changes. I didn't take that measure, but on the on, on this, uh, like, like when you don't, um, you can just eyeball it if it's greater than, if the QT interval is greater than 50% of the RR interval, um, you know, and the rates between, you know, not tachycardic, it's usually QT. Is there an option for STT changes as well? Is there, do we have a No, code? there's not for, 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 and that's where you'd say, well, you could code for ischemia or something here. Because the other things that can cause this are, well, what else can cause something like this? Mm. 
if there is apical hypertrophy, I don't know. I, I might be wrong. Yeah, yeah. Left pain, left pain disease. Left so. pain disease called Wellens waves. You know, mm -hmm. they get these big. That can so go along with ischemia, especially widespread multivessel left main ischemia. But in this case, again, pay attention to the stem. They, they will lead you, you know, to the right answer. And this is C, this is CNS. So. And do we have to comment on that morphology, like right com bundle branch block kind of morphology? Uh, on that? Yeah, that does. You know, that that is an incomplete right bundle branch block. Let's see if it's. Um, if it's, you know, you don't call that, it has to be 90 milliseconds. Otherwise, it's just, you know, sort of a normal variant thing. And this probably is not 90 milliseconds. It is 90 to 120 milliseconds is incomplete. Yeah, you're right. So you, know, you could code uh, incomplete right bundle branch block. You probably get a, get a point for that. All right. So let's go to... Um, So this is a 42 year old female with a prior history of ischemic cardiomyopathy. And um, she had just lost consciousness during the CCG and you were standing at the bedside. What is this? <laughs> Don't overthink it. I mean, I know that there is some, you know, twisting, you know, morphology, but this is what? The BG, uh, yeah. fibrillation. Yeah, this is ventricular fibrillation. You know, we uh, uh, torsad uh, is an option on the boards, um, and it looks like more like this, where you definitely see a more organized QRS and a more definite twisting around the point. You know, torsade de point, um, and um, so so this one is really much more fine and um, and irregular and you know disorganized, and it just happens. So it's really it's really coarse uh, beef the fib waves but uh yeah that's just plain old v fib any questions on that 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 has shown up on the boards but rookie we, we we should not expect there to be a uh a separate coding diagnosis for torsade de point is that correct it would only be v2 no no no. Because... no no there's there there is a there's a, there's a did you see that under the clinical d disorders? Uh, clinical disorders. There is a torsade. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and, and when you see torsade like that, you'd code you you could code VT, and you'd probably get one point for that. But I mean, torsade point is by definition VT. So you know you don't you don't necessarily have to code that, and um, and it's uh, often due to things like you know uh, low magnesium or something. But you also it's it's not necessary. So you wouldn't code the STT changes of of, uh, of electrolyte disturbance. And the reason I ask that is because if I remember correctly, torsade de point refers to a polymorphic VT that's usually related to a QT prolongation inside an event as opposed to ischemic mediated uh, polymorphic VT, which I don't think is not technically torsade de point, but it's simply VT. So that's for, for clarity. Yep, exactly right. If it's if it's VT with a normal QT, um, then it's not torsade. It's polymorphic VT. But that's not a code, you know, you just code that as, as VT. All right, so here's a 29-year-old um, asymptomatic black female with an abnormal chest X-ray that uh, they consult you on. This is a board favorite. Anybody? There are low voltages in the limb lead, so maybe sarcoid. Dextrocardia. Uh, right, it's dextrocardia. So, um, so you have this upside down P, Q, R, S, and T wave, just upside down in one in AVL. And the two things, when you see that, you think of two things. You think of either limb lead reversal, right? Incorrect electrode placement. Uh, which looks like this. Um, it's upside down P, Q, R, S, T wave, except you have a normal R wave progression. But when you see dextrocardia, like we see here, you see 
an upside down P, Q, R, S, and T wave, and you see a reverse, see the R wave kind of goes away. It's biggest in V1 and then goes away because the, the heart's on the right side of the chest, not the left. And uh, so this one is, yeah, it's, it's just, it's dextrocardia. Um, and other than that, you do code with dextrocardia, you code right at, with, with limb lead reversal, it's, it's sort of pseudo right axis deviation, it's just because they mixed up the right and left arm leads. But in this case, this is truly right axis deviation because the heart's on the wrong side of the chest. And then there's, this is a sinus rhythm. I think it's a sinus, yeah, sinus rhythm. And it's um, dextrocardia, which is one of these clinical disorders. So they love putting in examples of the clinical disorder. And uh, yeah, any questions on that? Oftentimes, this one had, um, uh, this person did not have uh, associated uh, congenital heart disease. I think she had situs inversus uh, with it. So that's the kind that's usually benign. And okay, let's go to uh, this one. It's an important one to recognize. So this is a 78 year old male with uh, metastatic lung cancer who's admitted with worsening shortness of breath. Here's his ECG. Time for tamponade. Very good, okay. Pericardial effusion, you couldn't say for sure it's tamponade and that's not an option on the board score sheet, but there's three things that make you think of a, a large pericardial effusion um, that, the, that would show up on the boards and they are, um, Sinus tachycardia, this is just a little less than 100, so you wouldn't code sinus tachycardia here, but low voltage, and there's low voltage, um, and the limb leads are less than less than five, clearly. The, this, this QRS over here is a little bit over 10, so you technically probably wouldn't code low voltage in the precordial leads. So you'd, and then the third thing is this electrical alternance and, and with pericardial uh, effusion and tamponade, it's a giant effusion and it's swinging back and forth in this large um, collection of fluid in the pericardium. And so it's, it's um, uh, sort of insulating the heart, the electrical signal of the heart. So the signal gets small and as the heart swings back and forth um, in the fluid, um, the, the size of the QRS varies. So when you see this beat to beat, you know, electrical alternance, uh, sinus tachycardia and low voltage, you know, that you would definitely code um, pericardial effusion. That electrical alternance we saw it earlier with VT, you can see with tachycardia. Here's another example, a little more even noticeable of that beat to beat variability. This one does have sinus tachycardia and uh, low voltage in the limb leads. So. Dr. O'Keefe, for clarity, you had mentioned that they do not fulfill the voltage criteria in the precordial leads. And so, right. That's less than 10, or that's greater than 10, uh, or less than 10, I apologize. Is that correct? Right, less than 10. Less than five in the, in the limb leads, less than 10 in the precordial leads. Okay, here is a 29-year-old um, Filipino male who suffered a syncopal spell. You need to recognize this for board purposes. Brogado. Very good. Brugada. This is a uh, type one Brugada, uh, where you get this uh, ST segment elevation, sort of a in, sort of a, a atypical right bundle branch block pattern. And you know you'd probably code the non the non specific IVCD here, but the key is this a sinus rhythm with Brugada. And uh, you know to to make the diagnosis of Brugada, you usually need to um, have syncope like this person or a family history of syncope uh, or somebody um, seeing. Uh, uh, are having um, uh, a family history of sudden death and a first degree relative. So, um, yeah, this is the non specific IVCD. Yeah. So, you need a uh, family history of sudden death and less than 45 years of age. This code, code ST segment elevation, the precordial leads in at least one other family member uh, or a syncope in another family member. So, let's just go back here. Um, I'll show you the other forms of Brugada. Um, this is. Um, this is type one that we saw, that's the most uh, worrisome type. The type two is the saddleback thing. There's, there's looks like a saddle in V2, V3. There's ST segment elevation. And type three is sort of like borderline Brigada where 
it's not two millimeters of ST segment elevation, which is generally we see at least two millimeters of ST segment elevation with this atypical right bundle branch block and usually T wave inversion like this. So that's type three. Um, but uh, they would, if they show you a Brugada, it'll be type one or type two with at least two millimeters of ST segment elevation. Okay, let's look at uh, 183. Okay, so this is a 75 year old female who is uh, on diltiazem and flecainide, uh, probably for AFib, uh, now with uh, fatigue and dyspnea. Comes in with um, the CCG. slow to load. Since that one's being a little stubborn, we'll move to this one. 62-year-old male with syncope and weakness. Anybody? So it's hard block twist to one block. It's uh, yeah, it little, looks okay. like two to one block, doesn't it? You know, and yes. uh, uh, but there's a couple of clues that it might be something more malignant. Is uh, if you first degree or degree? Yeah, it's third degree, degree block. Because if you see the the, the 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 fourth T wave in the rhythm strip down there, it doesn't seem to come back. The last one. Ex right? Exactly right, and this one then it disappears here too. Oh so. yeah. Yeah, so this is this is, but it's tricky because this the the PR is pretty stable, for, but it's shortening a little bit, and then this thing over here. So this is complete heart block, and when you do complete heart block, you always want to code the atrial rhythm. So that's a sinus rhythm, that's a ventricular. It's an idio slow idioventricular escape rhythm. One, two, three, four, five. So it's thirty beats per minute. You know, so that's a ventricular escape rhythm. Um, should code AV dissociation too. You always want to, you, know, you got to code the sinus rhythm, the ventricular escape rhythm, which is a, a accelerated idio, no, not accelerated, but a ventricular escape rhythm. Accelerated would be above, uh, above 60 beats per minute, 55 beats per minute. And then you do third degree AV block or uh, uh, AV block third degree and AV dissociation. Um, so um, yeah, so that's about it for that one. But um, but um, right. So um, let's see if we can get this one to load. So this is pretty similar, but but what do we think of that this is a seventy three? This is the one I was uh, talking about before. Diltiazem and flecainide on it. Now it has fatigue and dyspnea. So what's that one? Second degree. Yeah. So this is two to one AV block. Um, and a couple of clues. Remember the other one had a big wide QRS. Uh, this is a nice normal looking QRS, a probably less diseased heart. And this is two to one AV block. And you could say that there's first degree AV block there too, even the one that conducts, but that's not necessary to code for that for board purposes. But um, but yeah, this is two to one AV block in this person who's on DILT and flecainide, and you know probably got the AV node uh, kind of uh, over over medicated. Um, but so for the board score sheet, you don't know if this is Mobitz one or Mobitz two when it's straight. You know when it's when it, when you don't see um, you know if you when we looked on telemetry, this was this was actually Mobitz one. Um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't high grade AV block, but for this purposes, you just code the sinus rhythm and the two to one AV block, which, um, like I say, can be type one or type two. And, um, looks like, like this, the PR intervals, uh, uh, constant and every other beat is, uh, is dropped. So. Any questions on that one before we move on? 
is a super important one that uh, that that shows up on the boards regularly. Um, generally, pretty easy. If you're paying attention. Forty-three-year-old diabetic male complaining of pleuritic positional chest pain and had a pneumonia recently. This was on last year's boards. Not this exact tracing, but carditis. Pericarditis, right? So the difference between pericarditis, you know, like the like like you'd say, well, it could be ischemia or infarction. No, it's it's, you know, it's it's concave. It's not convex, and it's um and it's pretty much everywhere except uh, AVR. You see this ST same elevation, and if you look closely here, there's some PR depression, and that is pretty pathognomonic. You see how the PR kind of falls off there. That's pretty pathognomonic for uh, for a bradycard for uh, pericarditis. So um, yeah, that's uh, there, and again under clinical disorders, there's uh, acute pericarditis, and then that would be sinus rhythm and and uh, yeah. So um, for. For comparison's sake, here's a 23-year-old African American male uh, without symptoms being evaluated in the office. So what's what's that ST signal elevation? Early report. That's early report. And so this is a perfect example. So look at the ST signal elevation. It's just a, a tiny fraction of the T wave. The other one. It was like it was over fifty percent the ST segment uh, um, uh, elevation uh, in pericarditis, but benign early polarization number one has less magnitude of ST segment elevation. There's that little Osborne, that little J curve that we saw with the hypercalcemia, um, uh, but but the, they usually have big T waves. So when you see ST segment elevation that's less than and and it's and it's not as diffuse as as the pericarditis. And it's less than 25% of the T wave. Keep that in mind. The ST segment elevation is less than 25% of the P wave, the T wave, then that's more likely to be benign early repolarization. And you got a, you know, a young black male athlete. So, you know, it's um it, it also goes along with that. So um Dr. O'Keefe, there was a question about whether or not to code for normal sinus rhythm, early depolarization, and normal variant on the exam. Yes, yeah, you that one you'd also do normal variant um, because that you know that that's an option and and there's and I guess we should have scored that one out so you see how to score it. Um, that was twenty three. We'll go back to that. Good point because um, that's a little tricky, you know. Um, you you I mean it, it wouldn't be you wouldn't lose a lot of uh, of points for calling it just a normal ECG but but there's a normal variant ECG that um, that you probably should call uh, instead and and then there's STT changes uh, that are is a is a normal variant STT changes. So, um, yeah, those normal variants, it's not uncommon to see one on there. So the way to score this would be normal variant. That's, uh, and there's sinus arrhythmia there, right? See the sinus arrhythmia, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's 54. So it's sinus bradycardia, sinus arrhythmia. And then there's this early repolarization normal variant. So you'd score all of those for this one. Good. Okay. Um, so let's, here's another one that commonly shows up on the boards, a little, little uh, more difficult to recognize, but again, pay attention to the stem. Very important, especially in the ECG portion of the cardiology boards. So a 35 year old female smoker on oral contraceptive. She's in the emergency department now with dyspnea and presyncope. S one Q three T three P. Perfect. S one Q S one up here. Q 
kind of a red bundle branch pattern. Q3, look at that little Q wave there. Now, and, and Q3 and T3, inverted T wave. And it's a sinus tachycardia, the most common finding in acute pericardial uh, pulmonary embolism. Acute pulmonary embolism is, pericard is uh, sinus tachycardia. And, and this does just barely meet red bundle branch block, which goes along with that. And then these T wave abnormalities, uh, you often see a sort of RV strain that you could call ischemia, but often there's right axis and this is sort of rightward axis, but doesn't quite meet 90 degrees. So yeah, this is acute pulmonary, uh, acute poor pulmonary or pulmonary embolus. Is it you sinus stack or MAT? No, it's, it's sinus. No, that, that's a good pickup. It's not MAT, but those are two PVCs there. Those are PVCs. They're kind of narrow. Now, what PVCs. about the third, fourth, fifth, uh, that uh, fourth, fifth, sixth? Like that looks different, right? Right in through there. Yeah, but I mean, th I think that's some some artifact there. And plus, the, the the rate is perfectly normal there through that. So I, I don't think. I mean, this is one case where you would see MAT, but this would not quite meet criteria for MAT. I don't think. So, Keith, would you read a right bundle not there? Regularly or regular, yeah. Pardon me? Would you read a right bundle there? Yeah, you would read the right bundle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And for STT changes, what would you pick? So this is tricky. I think the way this, and, and I, you know, I, I, I did this, this O'Keefe ECG thing with uh, six other cardiologists, uh, um, who are uh, ECG experts, you know, so we'd go by consensus. And so, you know, we called this, I think we called it ischemia, you know, it's RV strain, but it's not due to RV hypertrophy. So there's an STT change that's suggestive of uh, uh, ischemia. And then there's the sinus tachycardia and the acute uh, corpomenal, and there's right bundle branch block, which is down here. And you do have an option of incomplete and complete right bundle branch block. This one is just a little over 120 milliseconds. Um, and um, oh yeah, and then those PVCs that we saw. But you know, that's one of the reasons I like doing this with fellows. You guys are so so um, observant and whatnot that it's not VT, it's PVCs there up there. Um, yeah, the, those, you know, it's hard to know if those are APCs or PVCs, but I guess um, that did look like there was a, so yeah, that's the way it was scored. Um, but there is a compensatory mm -hmm. pause here, so that's probably a PVC. Mm -hmm. But you know what, like on the boards, what they're looking for is they want you to recognize the, um, so you're going to get the vast majority of the points you're going to get just by recognizing that this is an acute PE, acute uh, pulmonary embolism. Okay, how about, um, here's a 72 year old female um, who came in about an hour ago with chest pressure and shortness of breath. What is that? Evaluation, right? In native complexes with Q way. Uh, there are two kinds of morphologies. One is the looks like native, another looks like PVC, like, yeah. right? By yeah, Zemini. Yeah. Yeah, and the uh, native yeah. complexes looks like there is diffuse ST elevation from anterior to lateral leads, right? With, uh, with, uh, reciprocal uh, ST depression in inferior leads. Mm -hmm. So that's perfect. So the inf like you don't code, once you code acute injury, right? This is an acute injury pattern. Yeah. Tombstones, right? This is the classic tombstones. Um, and, and they show up even on the PVCs, but these are the sinus beats down here where you see the P wave and clearly anterior to anteroseptal. That's uh, two or more leads where you see ST segment elevation more than for a female, more than 1.5 millimeters with, uh, in, in V1 to V3 or V4 is anterior or anteroseptal. And, and if, if it's V3 to V4 uh, and out there, that's acute anterolateral. And then up here, there's lateral infarction too, because it's more than one millimeter ST segment elevation and one in AVL. There's the PVCs you talked about. 
The, the easiest LVH criteria is greater than 11 millimeters in ABL, which it meets it there. So that's, that's, L, that's you know, it's a sinus rhythm. There's a left atrial enlargement, but the big, the big thing here is the, you know, the wide, widespread infarction um, that, um, yeah, she went to the cath lab, had a proximal subtotal LAD, 99%, and also, a, a, no, she had a total LAD and a 99% large first diagonal too, which is the, the, the high lateral, the, the lateral infarct. So coding this, you'd code the acute anterolateral because it's in V3 to V6, anteroseptal acute uh, or recent, lateral acute or recent. You know, uh, we, in the past we've said, you know, when you see this code, the STT changes uh, suggesting a myocardial injury, but you won't probably get extra credit for it since that goes along with the STEMI thing. Um, and this is uh, PVCs here, ventricular premature beats, and uh, there's not a ventricular bigeminy on the boards, but those are single PVCs. And then the sinus rhythm and the left ventricular hypertrophy and the left atrial abnormality. You know, there's a lot on here, but the key is getting the um, getting that um, getting those acute infarction uh, acute infarctions coded. And you need to you know you need to absolutely pay close attention to um, which leads are involved. Um, and again, we kind of go through it in detail if you uh, if you use our website, Dr. O'Keefe. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can you make a distinction between injury and ischemia uh, for the audience? Yeah, great question, Yev. Um, so injury is when you see the ST segment elevation. Once you see the ST segment elevation, you never code ischemia too, even though there's you know ischemia out of resistance, uh, at a distance, or 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 um, uh, uh, reciprocal changes. Those old-fashioned terms, you know. Sure, there's some ischemic myocardium on the edges of this of this dying myocardium, but these are these are two uh, separate things. You don't you don't code them together. So um, yeah, great question and something you you definitely need to pay attention to. There was also a question about whether to code just PVCs or parasystole. Could we just code PVCs or parasystole? Oh no, yeah. So that's a good that's a good point. So parasystole. These this is. Ventric this is ventricular bigeminy because this is a fixed coupling interval between the QRS and the PVC. All right. If you want to, this is, I, I keep thinking they're going to take this off the score sheet because it's so difficult to find examples of this. But um, there is something called ventricular parasystole where you see these frequent PVCs, but they don't bear a fixed relationship to the QRS. See, there's shorter, longer, medium. Mm -hmm. But if you if you pay attention, they bear a fixed relationship to each other. This is this is one, one time. This is two time. And if you look on telemetry, they have this protected focus in the my in the ventricular myocardium that's kind of marching to its own drum, so to speak. And it didn't it didn't show up here because you know the the, uh, the ventricle was uh, refractory from the sinus beat. So that's ventricular parasystole. You know, it's kind of a trivia question, and don't expect to see it on the boards. But no, this is ventricular bigeminy. Can you again uh, repeat it, Dr. Okufi? What is, like, I didn't get, what is the parasystole versus this one? So the difference is this one has a fixed coupling interval. See, the PVC comes at the exact same distance every time after the PVC, whereas the parasystole, it, 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 it bears no, um, no fixed um, coupling to the, um, to the okay. previous. But it's, the it's, interval between the two PVCs are regular. That is what you are. Regular, exactly. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah, it's a little tricky. All right. One last one. And what just, did you miss there? It says like one point was missed. I was just curious. What, uh, what, what, did, what did we miss? Um, this is a big long one. Um, so you don't call. You don't have to. Oh, there's left anterior fasciculi block. Uh, okay. Yeah, see, because you got the, you know, it's less than 45 degrees on this one. Uh, uh, um, yeah, and you don't have to code left axis deviation when you have left anterior fascicular block because that's that's part of the definition. Uh, so it's optional. Great questions. But this EKZ has LVS, so can we code both LVS and left anterior fascicular block? Yeah, you can code LAD and left interfascicular block, uh, and you wouldn't get marked off for it. But the important one is left interfascicular block because it's more than it's more than forty-five degrees. 
All right, just to round it off, we'll show you this one since we were talking about the difference between myocardial ischemia and uh, myocardial infarction. So here we have some ST saving elevation up in AVR, but, and this is a 51 year old female, ongoing chest pain radiating to the jaw, diaphoresis, nausea. In fact, she had a troponin of 0.1. Um, but what would you code this one? I mean, in the clinic, you'd call it a non STEMI because of the troponin and the chest pain and the abnormal ECG. But there's not a code for non STEMI uh, or STEMI for that matter on the boards. But, you know, the uh, acute or recent infarction is uh, effectively a STEMI. But no, this is myocardial ischemia. It's sinus rhythm with myocardial ischemia. And here is a good example of an incomplete right bundle branch block where that is, you know, it's about. 100 milliseconds. Uh, it's more than 90, but less than 120. And uh, so this one, even though there's a ST7 elevation, ST7 elevation in AVR, you need it in contiguous leads, like one in AVL or two, three AVF and two leads, or V3 to V1 to V6 and two contiguous leads, where the see the ST7 elevation um, to, to code uh, uh, an acute infarction. So this would just be a sinus rhythm with the incomplete right bundle branch block. And the um, STT changes suggesting myocardial ischemia. So, okay, well, um, any uh, any other last questions? Thanks for your patience and great questions. You guys are are paying close attention, and uh, uh, my guess is you'll do well on the boards. But uh, just study the, the ECG part is easy to study for. You just have to need to know these eighty nine diagnoses cold. And recognize them on the ECG, and you know um, yeah, uh, we've spent a ton of time, you know, putting this this uh, uh, ECG website together to to kind of make it easy for you guys. So, uh, and, and actually, one thing you can do, um, a lot of uh, programs are doing this. Just get your uh, program coordinator, program director to um, to to get a, um, a institutional subscription, and then then you can all use it for free. But. Thanks so much, guys, and uh, have a great holiday weekend. I really appreciate your tuning in and spending your valuable time with me. Thank you, Dr. O'Keefe, um, for you. sharing um, everything with us, especially over the Labor Day weekend. Um, for those of you that came in a little later, or for those that would like to review everything again, a copy of this uh, recording will be available on Dr. O'Keefe's uh, YouTube channel. Dr. O'Keefe, if you can tell them specifically how to access it, that would be great, but it will be available within the next few days. Um, I, I imagine for you to be able to look at it. We do have a few prior recordings that you can review as well. Yeah, I think you can just look up Dr. James O'Keefe um, on YouTube and look for the um, ECG, ECG board review. It should, should be there. All right. Well, thank Thanks you, everyone. Help. Thank you, Dr. O'Keefe. Yeah, I really appreciate your help. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. O'Keefe. Thanks, everybody.